The most amazing story of my life only makes up a few pages in God's master story. But let me tell you how it all began, and I think you'll see how it glorified the Lord Almighty, even if I couldn't see it at first. I, Naomi, was living the life I had always hoped for, being a wife to my husband and caring for our two sons. While we were living in Moab, my husband died, leaving me heartbroken, but not alone, as I had my two sons to comfort me. They soon married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Life went along for another decade when both of my sons also died, leaving me heartbroken again. And this time, alone with two daughters-in-law who were family, but not really, which is what makes the next part of the story so amazing. To keep ourselves from starving, we set out to go back to Judah. When I told the women to go back to their families, I expected them to do so willingly. Out of kindness and respect, at first they insisted on staying, but I reminded them of the long life they had stretching out in front of them that I did not have. At that time, I could only feel that the Lord had turned his hand against me and I had nothing to offer these two women. Orpah made the decision I hoped she would, but Ruth, oh Ruth, she surprised me. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Where you die, I will die. Even now, those words still touch my heart. So I found myself in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, heartbroken and bitter, but not alone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hunter Upton. I'm the associate pastor here at Goodwill Church South Haven. Uh, delighted that you've joined us for worship, especially if you're our guest this morning. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us. This morning, we're beginning a new sermon series in the book of Ruth. I'm really excited about this because as we walk through the book of Ruth this month, we're going to see the story of unmerited kindness, of unwavering loyalty, and of unchanging love. We're going to see that in the story that plays out between uh, Ruth and Naomi and others. We're also going to see how that story plays out in our lives uh, today. And so excited about the truths that we're going to discover uh, this month in the book of Ruth. Now, before we dive into our text this morning, I want to encourage you in two things. The first is we're continuing our Love Your Neighbor uh, challenge. And so we want to encourage you uh, to continue to step out in loving your neighbor and This week's challenge, are you ready, is to compliment a stranger. All right, so what I mean by this is when you find yourself in the line at the grocery store, you're pumping gas and there's a person next to you, or you're on the phone this week with someone for customer service because it's going to happen, find a way to be present, to, to sense what is the Lord leading you to to compliment this person. What is it that you notice that's good and admirable about them that you can offer that kind word, that kind gesture of a compliment to that stranger? I don't know what God's going to want to do with it, um, what that may mean for that person, what hope, what encouragement that may bring to them. But this week, I want to encourage you, step out, compliment a complete stranger uh, this week. So can we do that this week? All right, good. I got some nods. That's good. All right, someone's awake. It's 11 o'clock. It's like 12 o'clock, really, right? So we should be good. All right, so uh, second thing I want to encourage you about, uh, Susanna talked about this earlier, but coming up next week on November the 14th, we're going to have an event in here at 4 p.m. that's going to celebrate Bible discipleship groups. If you feel the Lord leading you, if you are at that point in this season of life that you're ready to dive into God's word with other people, I want to encourage you, please come, show up. And then sign up, take that step to walk from Genesis to Revelation together in community with others for two years. I promise you, if you come uh, next Sunday at 4 p.m. in this room, you're going to hear testimonies of what the Lord has done in people's life as they've walked through the Bible together with others, as they've heard the voice of God, as they understand the love more of what God has for them. And so I want to encourage you, if at all that sounds interesting, Show up next week, 4 p.m. in this room, uh, to learn more about that, to hear testimonies of what God has done, uh, and as we look forward to uh, what the future is going to hold as we get new groups that will form uh, in the new year. So next week, 
Bible Discipleship uh, Gathering at 4 p.m. in this room. If you want to learn more about Bible Discipleship groups, you can go to getwellchurch.org slash Bible Discipleship. All right, sound good? All right, let's dive into Ruth. If you've got a Bible or device you read from, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1. Ruth is in the Old Testament. Um, It is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. All right, so if you go past that, you've gone too far. So uh, Ruth, small little book, four chapters, but it's right after Judges. So let's pick up in verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Aphrathites from, ben- uh, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Let's stop there. We need to set the scene for for what's to come, for why the book of Ruth is important. And the first thing is that we notice from the text is that the story of Ruth takes place in the time of the judges. This is really important for us to understand what's going to happen. Uh, But if you joined us for our thread series back at the beginning of the year, uh, the time period of the Judges is characterized to me by this one line that we find in the book of the Judges. It's, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's kind of the controlling story of this time period. It's a time marked with immorality, with uh, disloyalty, with pursuit of everything other than God by God's own people. It was a rough 350 years in Israel's history. And really just the one book of Judges, this time period covers almost 25% of Israel's history in in the Old Testament. Uh, People were self-centered and they were self-serving. And I'm sure glad that we've moved past that today, right? But it's during this time that a man man named Elimelech, an Israelite, and his family, they left Bethlehem. And I love that the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And so Elimelech and his family, they leave this this town, this place whose name hinted at a place of nourishment, but they leave because it is not a place of nourishment because of this famine. And so they head out of town. They're trying to find where where are we going to find food? And so where do they end up? They end up in an enemy nation of Israel. They end up in Moab. So there's a famine, there's no food, there's no bread, so they set out to find sustenance. Now this famine, it's, it's no surprise uh, to God's people, or at least it shouldn't have been, uh, because back when God established his covenant with, with Israel, he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. In that covenant, he laid out for them in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, uh, kind of a list of if you're obedient, these are the blessings that will come. And y'all, they are great blessings. And when you're disobedient, here's what will happen. It was already told this is what was going to happen. And as you can tell from Israel's history, clearly they were not being obedient at all, correct? And so it's a rough time. They're trying to find nourishment. There, it seems like a desert. There's, there's just famine everywhere. And so they find themselves in this foreign land, settling down, uh, finding food. Well, what's going to happen next? Let's pick up in verse 3. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other woman, other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malan and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Now, having no food is a crisis, yes. But in this day and time, not having someone to carry on your family's lineage was even more of a crisis. This was a bigger crisis for Naomi because she has lost her, not only her husband, but also her two sons. And these two women, these two Moabite women, they've lost their husbands. Can you imagine? You've, you've, made, your, you've made your way to this distant and foreign nation to find refuge from a famine and then your husband dies. But at least you've got your two sons, right? Right? 
So, so they marry two women. They, you do life day in and day out together for 10 years. They become so ingrained a part of your life. You as a widow are so deter, uh, um, just dependent upon your sons and the family and what, all that that's entailing. But then your two sons die. You're left widowed. You're left with, with daughters-in-law. You're alone in this land. What would happen now? And in that day, I think it was impossible for a woman to, to continue to live and to survive without a husband because of the social structure of the ancient Near East. And also, she's a foreigner, right? She's in a foreign land. And so I think that would have been even more difficult for Naomi to survive, uh, to have life uh, there in Moab. And so I can imagine that Naomi's mind is probably just racing, Right? Uh, where is God's goodness in this? I've lost my husband. I've lost my, my sons. I'm left here in this land. I may have food, but what about this lineage? What about, what about all that, that a son would inherit from, from Elimelech's line? Who's going to inherit all this land and money and the name that Elimelech has, the promises, the things that were given to our family? Who's going to carry this on? Is all this just going to fall away? And I think that also in her mind is probably this thought of there's still a famine in the land. There's still, I'm still not at my home, this promised land that God has given. Is he going to forget his people? Is God going to continue to be faithful to his promises? Is he going to see it through? Is God truly good? When we experience afflictions, we ask those very same questions. We wrestle with those same things. But it's what we do with those questions. It's how we respond to those questions that makes all the difference in the outcome. And so 10 years pass between the, de- between the time that Naomi has left Bethlehem to the time that she makes her way into uh, Moab and she finds herself here. Was this famine, were these afflictions, were they going to last forever? Let's see, let's pick up in verse 6. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes. And may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still birth to, uh, can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Naomi and her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, they face a very uncertain future. We're not sure how much time passes between the death of her sons and the time that she hears of God's blessing. You know, was it hours? Was it days? Weeks? Months? I don't know. But can you imagine? You've just experienced this grief. You're asking those questions, where are you, God? And you hear those sweet words that God has remembered his people. In the excitement of being able to return home, Naomi sets her face to Bethlehem. She's headed back 
to the promised land, to her home. And with her comes Orpah and Ruth. But along the way, I think that Naomi realizes, whoa, I have nothing to, to give these, these two women. Because they're headed back to Naomi's homeland, to, to her people, not theirs. And she knows that there's no way that she's going to get remarried at this point and, and give them the life that they deserve again. And that's because back in the day, your life was connected to if you were married or not. And so she tries to send them back to their mother's homes so that there at least they would be cared for until they could get remarried. But even despite her great loss, Naomi still trusts God. She still, still holds on to her faith in her Lord. Because she gives them this blessing in verses 8 and 9. She says, go back to your mother's, to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Naomi prays that the Lord will reward Ruth and Orpah with kindness equal to and even greater than that of what they had shown to Naomi and to her husband and to their husbands. Now the word for kindness in that verse is, is the word, is the Hebrew word has said. It's the Hebrew word has said, and it's, an, it's a very wholesome, multi-dimensional word that really comes down to this definition of faithful love in action. Faithful love in action. It's not just saying you love someone, but it's actually acting on it. It's often translated, and, and your translation may say this, as loving kindness. Loving kindness. It appears over 200 times in the Old Testament, most often whenever it's describing God and the love that he has. It's God's loyalty to his covenant and his love for his people, but also it's this idea of, of him as a promise keeper, one who has made a promise and will see it to completion. So this word has said, it carries the notion of kindness, of faithfulness, of mercy, goodness, loyalty, and the steadfast love of God. And so Naomi, she asks God to bless these women because of their faithful love that they've shown not only to Naomi, but also to, to their family. And so Orpah and, and Ruth, they refuse, uh, but Naomi insists. And at that, Orpah does the expected. She says, thank you, I love you, and I'm headed back home. And it's Ruth. Ruth does the unexpected. She doubles down. I'm, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm with you. And I love how the text says she clung tightly to Naomi. And so Ruth gives her pledge to, to uh, Naomi. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. And your God will will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Why would Ruth make such a pledge as this? Why? Why is she doing this unexpected thing when she could have just, like it made so much sense for her just to turn around and go back home. Why is she making this decision? It's because even though she's a foreigner, even though she's an outsider to the covenant of God, she has seen and experienced the Lord's has said through Naomi and her family. She, she sees, she, she desires, she wants what Naomi has. And that's a relationship with the true and good and living God. Ten years She's walked with them. Ten years she's experienced God's has said through the life of, of this family. And so she wants this. So why she says, wherever you go, where, wherever you live, your people, your God, not the gods of, of, of my people, but your God, I am going with you. And so Ruth continues to show this extraordinary has said to Naomi not leaving her wherever, you know, it was that what, for what lied ahead, but to go with her. And God is going to reward that. You see, this practice of, of loyal and compassionate devotion, it pleases God. 
So much so that, that we can expect that he does reward that, that, that practice of his said when we practice that with others. It's a gracious gift that our God wants to do as he honors our human has said with others. It's that faithful love in action. But only those who practice it will receive it. Naomi wishes to return, to go back to the promised land, to find God's blessing again of provision. But Ruth has devoted herself to what God is wanting to do in her life as she practices has said, even though she may not fully understand the fullness of has said of what the Lord has done yet, but I think in time she will come to understand that. And so Ruth and Naomi, they trust God even without seeing him fully at work just yet as they continue on that path back to Bethlehem. You see, faithfulness to God is key in our afflictions. Faithfulness to God is key in our afflictions because we, like, like Naomi and Ruth, we can trust and we can remain faithful to God because of God's has said over and over and over again, we're reminded that God is faithful. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. He will continue to be faithful always, always, always. So let's see what happens next. Let's pick up in verse 19. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. So if Ruth models for us what complete devotion looks like, I think that Naomi models for us what uh, utter honesty looks like. Naomi's words uh, about being bitter, they point to the mysterious and often, at least from a human perspective, what we sometimes think is the unjust workings of God. Here's the thing, though. God is not the author of evil. He's not the, he does not make bad things happen. What God does do is he redeems those evil, those bad things that happen in our lives and in this world. Naomi might feel as if the Lord has done this to her. But oftentimes we don't see what the Lord is doing behind the scenes, what, how he's working to redeem in the midst of our situation. See, the point is this. It's not up to us to understand God. It's up to us to trust him. It's up to us to trust God. Naomi might have felt as if God was against her, but he certainly was not. He's going to prove his faithfulness in time as they return to Israel. And in time, Naomi's going to look back and, and see this season and see the significance of all of it. She and her family, they left Judah with no food. And yet they return. She returns when there's a harvest. God has turned something that was barren into something that now has a yield of abundance. Where there was death, there's now life. This first chapter of Ruth is a foreshadow for us. It's a ray of hope of what's to come. Not only in Naomi and Ruth's life, but in all, in all people's life as well. We're going to see that over the course of, of this series. But for all who have surrendered and followed Jesus, God is at work in our lives beginning that redemption. He promised it. And he's going to see it through. And that's why Paul can write confidently uh, to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6. He said, God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not done. Even whenever it seems hopeless, even when it seems dark, even in the midst of it, God's promises are still trustworthy and true. God is still at work. So even though she's bitter, Naomi clings to God, and Ruth clings to Naomi. God blesses Hesed, 
that faithful love and action, even when we don't see that blessing right now. Often our deeds, and it's not so much always divine intervention, but it's our deeds that God uses to exercise his power and his love in this world. And that's because our has said that faithful love in action, it displays God's has said, which is why we can do the unexpected as God's people. We can do the unexpected. We can do what people aren't expecting in this world because we understand and we've, been, we've seen God's has said. So what is that unexpected thing that God is calling you to do? As we love our neighbors, we display that kindness, that faithfulness, that loyalty, mercy, goodness, that steadfast love of God. 1 John 4, 19, it tells us that we love because he first loved us. We're sharing with others what we have been shown. It means that we, we empty ourselves of our self-centeredness, of our self-serving attitudes, and we allow God to come and give us a heart of flesh, one that cares, and a mind of Christ that sees and knows and understands what everyone else also needs. It's a heart and a mind for others in Jesus. So there's some unexpected thing that God has called you for. Something full of has said that he has destined you to do. He's gifted you. He's calling you to do that. What is that thing? Something I want us to wrestle with as we, as we go through this series. What is that thing that God has called us to do? And you see, friends, we can do the unexpected because God did the unexpected for us. When we deserve punishment for our sins, that is the punishment for that. Yes, death. That is what we deserve. But yet God has done the unexpected in sending his son Jesus to, the, to this earth in human form, full of God, and yet fully human, to live a perfect life. To live a life fully devoted to God, but also fully in a, in a fullness of love to his neighbor. He lived this life, understanding the loyal, the, the never-ending loving kindness of God to go to the cross on our behalf, to take our sin so that we could have life. It's the power of God at work and display the love, the loyal, loving kindness of God. His has set on display on the cross for our sins and it gives us life. 